going live on everything else as we speak. That's awful here. Go. Awesome. So the life. Good evening, everybody. Um, if you're watching this in recorded format, hello. But as always, I'm just going to wait around a little bit until a few people tune in. Hello to everyone that's tuning on Instagram. Hope you're having a wonderful evening. Um, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about hit versus list, so high intensity versus low intensity cardio, and the reasons for or against either version. Um, this is going to be a Q&A though, so if you're watching this live, please do throw in any questions that you want answering. They don't have to be related to hit versus list. Um, throw in anything you want and we'll go for it. Uh, the stream is probably going to be about half an hour long. My streams usually are. Um, but of course, if I'm finished wittering in five minutes and nobody asks a question, then we will finish early. So do ask questions if you want to know some. So when it comes down to deciding whether hit, so we'll define our terms first. So hit is high intensity interval training. Um, that is different to the kind of interval training that most people do. So most people will do interval training where you do something that's quite hard for maybe a minute, then you'll have a minute rest, and then you'll do it again. Or it may be 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, something like that. High intensity interval training is where you go at 100% effort for a period of time, and then you recover. And usually what that's going to look like is something like 30 seconds effort, maybe a minute and a half recovery, if not a little bit longer. High intensity interval training is hard. If you can maintain like 10 rounds of a minute on a minute off, that's not really high intensity because that's going to be far too much work. Like 10 minutes of 100% effort, unless of course you build up to it, is going to be basically impossible. So that's the high intensity interval training we're talking about, the hard stuff. Then after that, we're going to be talking about lists or low intensity steady state cardio. That's when you're jogging on a treadmill or jogging on the pavement or riding a bike, that kind of stuff. And the decision of whether to do one or the other could be based on basically what you're trying to achieve. Now, the first thing that I would always consider whenever you're thinking like, oh, well, is hit better or is list better? Well, which one do you prefer? As always, that's going to be the first question because primarily, because fundamentally, if I was to sit here and say, oh, well, HIT training is the best form of training that there is, but you absolutely hate it and you enjoy going out for a half hour jog or you enjoy going out for a few miles on the bike, then my conversation, this entire chat is completely pointless because you wouldn't want, you wouldn't enjoy that. You don't want to do it. And so you do the one that you enjoy. But let's say you're relatively agnostic. Let's say that you're either you've never done either or you're just not bothered. You just want the results. Well, the first thing that we need to come to terms with is the reason that you would do it. So if you're looking for weight loss, which is the primary reason that I find most people start introducing cardio into their life, as most people would know, I hope, the only thing that's going to cause weight loss is a calorie deficit. And so we need to look at the influence that either of these forms of exercise has on your calorie, calorie expenditure and your calorie intake. Now, what's often said is that HIIT training is better for weight loss, and I'll come to reasons for that in a minute. But the straight-up fact of the matter is that list training, so low-intensity, steady-state cardio, will probably burn more calories than HIIT training will, and therefore it will have a greater influence on your calorie expenditure than HIIT will. And the reason for that is, although HIIT is very, very tiring, and although, let's say you do a session of intervals, your sports watch or your Fitbit or whatever will say that you've done a lot of exercise, the problem is that you spend most of that hit session resting. You spend an all, almost all of the time is spent recovering from the effort. And your Fitbit doesn't know this. So all your Fitbit does when it's, ex when it's telling you what your calorie expenditure is, is it's looking at your heart rate and then it's correlating your heart rate to your expenditure. But the problem is that your heart rate's still elevated even when you're resting and your expenditure's not being increased. So you can burn calories through HIIT training, but because most of the time is spent resting, you'll burn far fewer calories than you will for a session of lists. And the other reason for that is that you can simply do more of it. So while it may be the case that you can do five, six, seven, let's say 10 intervals, 10 hard intervals, and you might burn a couple of hundred calories. With list training, the thing that really prevents you from doing more is either time constraints or boredom. Um, you can do lists for pretty much as long as you want. And so you can burn about as many calories as you want. And so that's going to have a great influence. But the big thing that does need to be taken into consideration when looking at exercise for weight loss isn't just how many calories am I going to burn, but what will this have, what influence will this have over time? And 
that's not just on the calorie expenditure. HIIT training is more tiring. HIIT training is going to have a far greater effect on your ability to do resistance training because the recovery capacity that you're using or would ideally be using to recover from resistance training is going to be taken up by recovery from HIIT training. Not only that, but it's simply going to be more taxing on your central nervous system, which is going to enable you, which is going to prevent you from lifting as heavy as you ordinarily would. So during weight loss, Resistance training is going to be incredibly important because you want to maintain as much muscle mass as possible. And if you're spending all of your recovery capacity doing a bunch of lift, doing a bunch of hit training, and doing a bunch of intervals, then you're not going to be able to do that as effectively. And so, arguably, hit training is going to be far more detrimental in weight loss. The other side of this factor, we need to factor in hunger. Now, both hit and list training will increase your hunger after you've done that exercise. But it seems as though list is the one that, do, that does the most damage in terms of list can make you more hungry than hit training can, um, at least after you've adapted to both of them. Both forms of exercise will make you really hungry after, in the first couple of weeks just because increasing your activity acutely increases your, your appetite. But because list training can effectively reduce your blood glucose so well, then this can, in effect, make your appetite increase too. So when you're looking at whether you're going to do HIIT versus list training, your basic, if you're looking to lose weight, your basic choice is this. You've got the one that's going to make you more hungry, which is list, or you've got the one that's going to make you less likely to be able to perform in the gym, which is HIIT. And so what I would always suggest and what I recommend to clients is that, in fact, during weight loss, your recovery capacity is the most important thing. And so I wouldn't advocate doing HIIT training when you try to lose weight. What I would advocate doing is focusing on resistance training. And then you, if you want to do a little bit of cardio, focus on list training. Low intensity, steady state, up to maybe half an hour, one or two times per week. Increase that if you have to, but most people don't. And that's going to make sure that you're not you're not affecting your appetite too much, but you're also not going to be affecting your resistance training performance, which is the key thing. So that's weight loss. When it comes to muscle gain, the same principle applies. I wouldn't recommend, to be honest, doing HIIT training during a phase when you're trying to get really strong because HIIT training is going to tax your recovery and your central nervous system. The one time that I would recommend HIIT training is if someone is doing no resistance training at all, because this is going to be getting you to utilize your fast twitch muscle fibers. It is going to get you to improve your anaerobic um, fitness, which is quite important for health. And so if you're not, if someone isn't doing resistance training, HIIT training is going to be really useful. The other reason that you would ever do HIIT training, as someone mentioned on Instagram, and hello everybody, by the way, this is a q and I'm not just wittering on, I see I've got loads of people in live, so I'll be finished wittering on in about two or three minutes. At that point, it will be open to whatever questions you've got. If you want to ask a question, throw it in. If you don't throw any questions in, this will be a rubbish Q&A, and so we'll finish it. So someone said here, uh, list worked great for my half marathon last year, took discipline, but no sickness or injuries in prep, which is fantastic. This is the thing. If you're doing some sort of, in, some sort of endurance event, which I would class a half marathon as, um, you want to train for that specifically. And so most of your training will need to be marathon style running. Now, some of that will be pace work. So you might do 1K intervals, for example. But you wouldn't do really hard interval training. The time when I would recommend doing hit training, like seriously hard intervals, is, as I've already mentioned, if you enjoy it or if you're not doing resistance training or if you are doing some other athletic thing that requires you to sprint regularly. So we're looking at basically team sports. If you're a rugby player, if you're a football player, if you're a hockey player, if you're a basketball player, if you're a netball player, all these kinds of different sports, it's very important for you to be able to accelerate quickly and it's important for you to be able to do repeated bouts of anaerobic activity. And so I would recommend hit training for these kinds of people. The same thing could be said for uh, boxers, MMA athletes, or other sort of combat athletes that are looking to improve their ability to perform anaerobically. At that point, hit training becomes really important because you're working on your anaerobic fitness and you ain't going to do that by doing aerobic things like list training. But outside of those specific instances, so someone that doesn't resistance train, someone that just really enjoys hit training, which is fair enough, or someone that wants to improve anaerobic fitness for a sport specific purpose, outside of those three instances, I don't tend to recommend hit training. The cost to your central nervous system and overall physical recovery from exercise is too great in my opinion and I would much rather people pay attention to their resistance training. Resistance training is going to improve your anaerobic fitness as much as you really need it to be for general health and so you've got no need to be more anaerobically fit than that. 
unless you're planning on starting to do some sort of sporting events. So, yeah, if you're looking at HIIT versus list training, outside of those three events, the answer is list training. That is the one to do. Um, list training got a really bad rap a few years ago when everyone started to decide that really hardcore training and your training needs to be really hard and if you you need to go and push the prowler and run hills. And that's all well and good, but that sort of macho attitude doesn't necessarily match up with what is best for people if they're looking to perform long term. And while it's not as interesting, hitting the pavement, although to be honest, I would recommend if people are going to run quite regularly, first of all, get good shoes. Um, and secondly, try to run on grass where you can um, try to reduce that impact. But for most people, you can't do that. You've got to run on pavement. So yeah, get good shoes. Um, but that is going to be the better kind of activity. Um, you could also look at things like um, rolling machines, bikes, things like this, which are going to reduce impact on your joints. One of the big things that we do need to say when we're talking about this is injury rates. And believe it or not, in a world where people do rugby, where people do boxing, where people do MMA, the one sport that's got the highest injury rate versus any other is running. Now, of course, some of that is going to be because simply more people do it. But also we need to bear in mind that people who run are absolutely not unprone to injury. And most of the injuries that are going to occur through running occur either because of improper gait so people are just inefficiently running. Big problem with running is that people think it's a natural movement, so they don't bother getting coaching to learn how to do it properly. You're like, oh, I can run. But you've got to remember that squatting is a natural movement too, and most people are rubbish at that, um, <laughs> especially when they start. Most people need to practice to get really good at squatting, and the same is true of running. Most people run and get as horrible, and that's what contributes to their injuries. But if you're continually beating the pavement, that's potentially going to increase your injury risk too. And so I'd recommend if you are doing a lot of list cardio, try to find alternative methods to do it. So live Q&A performance now, performance portion now, live Q&A portion now, this is not performance. Um, if you've got any questions, throw them in, I'll get them answered. Uh, outside of that, we'll just crack on. So uh, one question there, what is it? Um, I'm guessing it's either hit training or list training. Um, that I was talking about. I'm not sure what time you tuned in there. Um, so I'm currently trying to gain all over muscle mass and training my physique. However, I love to skip and jog. Is this going to affect me and in, in, in my end result? The answer to that is always going to depend on the dosage. So excessive cardiovascular training can indeed reduce your muscle gaining potential. Um, you're going to eat into your recovery capacity is the most simple way to explain it. You also need to look potentially at some changes in muscle fiber composition. So you've got three primary different kinds of muscle fibers. You've got type 1, type 2A, and type 2B. Type 1 fibers, they're your fast twitch fibers. Type 2B fibers are your, sorry, type 1 fibers are your slow twitch fibers, so your endurance ones. Type 2B are your fast twitch fibers. And then type 2A kind of sit in the middle. Depending on the kind of training you're doing, your type 2 A fibers move slightly closer to type 1 or slightly closer to type 2. And the problem is if you're doing an awful lot of endurance training, you can potentially reduce your body's ability to shift those type 2 A fibers in the direction you want them. Though realistically, how much of a difference that's going to make, it's difficult for me to say. Um, what I would say is that if you do enjoy skipping and jogging, absolutely do do that. But bear in mind that you would ideally do that after resistance training if you're going to do it at all. And you would account for it in your calorie intake. And also try not to try to avoid doing junk exercise. Junk exercise is exercise that doesn't have a specific purpose. Like every time you go to the gym, if you're lifting weights, the idea should be that every set that you do is designed to either get you stronger or make you bigger, which is by getting you stronger. There needs to be a purpose to that. You shouldn't do any reps that are just there to get a pump. You shouldn't do any reps that are just there to get volume in. And the same goes for programming cardiovascular exercise. You shouldn't ever have junk miles. That's just a mile that you just run for the crack. Your, your running should either be pace work, it should be distance work, or it should be recovery work. It shouldn't be just, oh, I'm going to go and do a 5K, because while that does expend calories, it's not getting you fitter and it is eating into your recovery capacity. If you want to get really fit in terms of endurance training and you also want to build muscle all over your physique, I would highly recommend checking out the work of a guy called Alex Viada. So Alex, A-L-E-X, V-I-A-D-A. He does that whole, that whole shebang of people who want to get marathon fit and also powerlifter fit. Um, so yeah, check out Alex's work. He's far more qualified to speak on this than I am. 
Uh, does treadmill running help reduce the risk of injury or is it just as detrimental as road running? If anything, it's worse because the motion is so unnatural. Um, there are those cool treadmills now that are kind of like dipped in the middle. Um, and I don't think they actually move. You just, you run on them and that's what makes it run. And that makes the motion a little bit more natural. They're quite good. Um, but treadmill running because of the, the way that the movement works is arguably worse than running on, on the road. I'd rather people run outside. Um, if you're absolutely limited to treadmill running, fine. But truthfully, it's not the way that I would recommend people do it over the long term. I'd look to try and find alternative ways to run or don't run. If you don't have to run, so if you're not competing in marathons or like in the army or something where you get tested in actually being able to run, uh, if you just want to be a fit person, um, I would recommend doing stuff other than running. So cycling, uh, cross trainer, uh, rowing machine would be my personal preference um, because that's going to be far less detrimental to your joints and looking after your joints, you only get one set. Uh, using a list for weight loss, full incline walks or decent incline with a steady jog. It doesn't really matter um, whichever one you enjoy more. I would imagine that doing the steady jog would probably burn more calories. Walking up uphill on an incline probably is less detrimental to your recovery, but it's probably much of a muchness. And honestly, I would just go with the one you prefer personally. Uh, what type of cardio do you recommend for pull strength training on push-pull leg days and for how long? 15, 20 minutes is all you're really going to need. Um, if you're going to do HIIT training, that's when I would do it, after those strength sessions. Um, it's the principle of it's better to have three days a week that absolutely suck and are really hard than having like six days a week that are just quite hard. Um, having those extra di having those days fully. So let's say you do push-pull legs and you do four sessions a week. If you're going to do HIIT training, do your HIIT training after the two hardest sessions of that week. Um, what that's going to do is it's going to compound all of the difficult stuff in one day, giving you five days when you're not doing really difficult stuff over which you can recover. If you've got two really hard sessions, which is probably like a pull and a leg session in a week, um, or if you're like me and you train legs three times a week, then you need those days off in between to recover, and so it's better to do the hard cardio on those days. But what I would recommend personally is if you're looking to do some cardio and Bear in mind, you don't have to, um, but it is beneficial. And if you're going to do some cardio, I'd recommend you're going to do this. Um, 15 to 20 minutes is sufficient to get any real benefit that you're going to get from it if you're not someone that needs to be cardio fit for some reason. Um, and I would recommend either the road machine or something else that's low impact. Uh, thank you very much. No problem. Is running uphill or flat better for fat loss? As again, it's much of a muchness realistically. The only thing that's going to cause, so as I said at the start, um, the only thing that's ever going to cause fat loss is going to be a calorie deficit, and that's primarily going to come from nutritional management. Um, the issue with using running for, as a fat loss tool at all is that as you run, you're going to increase fatigue, which is going to stop you moving around for the rest of the day so much. Um, there was one really good study, which I if someone wants to read the study because you don't believe me, um, drop us a message and I'll send it to you. Um, but yeah, there was one study where individuals were, they had their baseline metabolic activity, so their total daily energy expenditure at rest measured, and then they did some exercise. And what the researchers found was that as exercise increased up to about 250 calories of expenditure, their total daily energy expenditure increased by 250 calories, as you would expect. But after that point, all that happened was the person started moving less in the day so that it almost balanced out. So even the people who were doing like 600 calories a day of exercise across the course of the day didn't increase their total daily energy expenditure any more than the people who only did 250 calories of exercise because they adapted to it in other ways. And so I don't recommend running as a weight loss tool to begin with. But if you're going to choose one to just increase your energy expenditure a bit and improve your fitness, um, running up a hill or on flat, it, it, it depends on what you prefer. Running up a hill is going to be harder. Running up a hill is going to be much more taxing on your recovery, um, but it's probably going to be a bit more enjoyable and interesting. So it's entirely up to you. Does wearing a 10 kilo weight vest help with weight loss and will you recommend it? What is your rationale? It does. So this is a very good one, actually. That's a really cool question. So one of the things that's fairly well known 
is that as you lose weight, you start to burn fewer calories throughout the day. Um, and this is referred to as metabolic adaptation. Now, people talk about this in terms of like metabolic damage and stuff, and all of that is massively overstated. But the fact of the matter is that if a person who is 100 kilos loses 30 kilos, when they're 70 kilos in weight, they will burn fewer calories during the day. Some of that will be to do with some forms of adaptation. So it's, that's all related to a hormone named, known as uh, named leptin. Um, so leptin's a hormone that's released from your fat tissues, your adipocytes, feeds into your hypothalamus, and through a variety of different mechanisms, including your sympathetic nervous system and your thyroid, it can reduce or increase your metabolic rate a bit. But the main reason why a person who's lost weight will burn fewer calories is because they're a smaller person. And carrying around less weight means that you burn fewer calories throughout the day, obviously. If you wear a 10 kilo vest to make up the weight that we've lost, that you've lost, that actually fixes itself a bit. So that's actually something that's been studied. So there was, there's two arms in these studies where one group of people will lose weight, the other group of people will lose weight. And as they lose it, they will replace that weight using a weighted vest. And those people tend to have better outcomes. So yeah, it is something that helps because it can just burn more calories throughout the day. I can imagine it's not something you'd want to do in summer when it's really hot. Um, it can also be a little bit restricted in terms of like the clothes you can wear. You wouldn't want to be like rocking around town and get the Tesco's with a 10 kilo vest on. But if you're going to go and do some steps, if you're going to go out for a walk and you try and lose weight at the time, there's no harm in wearing a 10 kilo vest or putting on a heavy backpack. Um, random one, but is it safe to eat liver daily? No. Um, so liver is very, very, very high in vitamin A, um, which is brilliant but you can get vitamin A toxicity. And so, no, I don't recommend that you consume liver every day. I would recommend usually about a portion a week would be your upper end. Um, now, if you like me, I really like liver, so I would happily eat it daily if I could, but it's not a good idea because fat-soluble vitamin A does build up in your tissues and it can cause you major problems if you eat too much of it. So, no, don't eat liver daily, please. Unless you're eating like a really small amount. Like if you're eating like 25 grams of liver a day for whatever reason, that's fine. But if you're eating like a normal person portion, um, once a week would probably ideally be your limit. And it's one of the things to risk to reduce when you're pregnant, as far as I'm aware. Um, what do you think of the face oxygen mask when doing cardio? Is it rubbish? Yes. Um, so the idea of these oxygen masks. My dude, you're coming up with some awesome questions, by the way. Keep it going. Um, so... When you do cardio or any exercise really, um, what has to happen is that your body has to be able to transport oxygen around your body. Fair enough. Now, the way that it does this is with your red blood cells. Your red blood cells are the things that carry oxygen around your, around your body using the hemoglobin that's in the middle of it. And therefore, it stands to reason that the more red blood cells you've got, the more oxygen you can transport, the more oxygen you can transport, the more you can perform when you're exercising. And this seems to pan out. And this is why people do altitude training. So altitude training is where you will go to a place that is at altitude and you will train. And when you do that, your body will adapt by increasing the amount of red blood cells you've got. That will then mean that when you return to flat land, when you return to sea level, you're able to perform a little bit better because you've got the capacity to transport more oxygen around your body because your body has adapted to a, to a climate, to an environment in which there's less oxygen in the air. I hope that makes sense. Now, people have taken advantage of this. A lot of Olympians will go and train at altitude before the Olympics, for example. You can also do blood doping, though I don't recommend you do that, which is where people will transfuse themselves with additional red, well, with additional red blood cells. Um, but the other way that people have tried to do this is by using altitude masks, because altitude masks make it harder to breathe, and this, the theory goes, will enable you to get all of the benefit of training at altitude. But there are a million problems with this. First of all, all an altitude mask does is it makes it harder for you to breathe. When you're at a height, when you're at, when you're at altitude in an environment in which your body would start producing more red blood cells, it's not harder to breathe. When you breathe, there is less oxygen in the air. When you start breathing through your altitude mask, although it's harder to actually draw the air in, once the air is in your lungs, there's the same amount of oxygen in it as there, already, as there always ever was. And so your body doesn't adapt by making red blood cells. The other problem is, well, one of the other problems is 
when you wear one of these masks, you're only wearing it for like two hours a day. When you're working in, when you're training at that altitude, you literally live up there. These adaptations take time. So even if the masks reduce the oxygen in the air, which they don't, um, they wouldn't make you create more red blood cells because you're not wearing it all of the time. The final problem with them is it can massively alter your breathing patterns. And one of the big things, anyone that's got any endurance um, experience will tell you is that you need to get into a pattern with your breathing. You need to have your breathing controlled. You need to know exactly what you're doing with it. And so if you've got one of these masks on that just throws off your breathing when you're exercising, then if anything, it's going to make your performance worse. Not only that, but because it makes training harder, you can't train as hard, and that's going to make your performance worse. The only possible application I can think of for a training mask is in someone that's doing something like MMA or grappling where there are going to be regular periods where it is harder to breathe and it can be useful for you to kind of experience that a bit but it's almost almost never the case that the reason that your performance is limited is because you need to have stronger muscles for inhalation and so no I don't recommend the training masks whatsoever um, this is a q &A, guys I've got a few people tuned in now keep throwing questions at me and we'll keep answering them. Million dollar, million question. Million dollar question, and off on a tangent, how much protein do you suggest daily? That is going to depend on your goals. Um, for the general public who are just looking to be healthy, um, about 1.2, 1.4 grams will be enough. Um, if someone's trying to lose weight, you could probably elevate that to 1.6 grams. This is per kilo of body weight, by the way. Um, if you're looking to gain muscle, between 1.6 and 2.2 grams per kilo. I personally err on the higher side of that when making recommendations, but I do so as it, this is my own conjecture. That's not something that's as strongly evidenced in the literature. The literature seems to suggest that 1.6 to 2.2, um, that's based on figures from a study with Eric Helms, uh, I want to say last year. Um, if you're looking to lose weight, 2.3 to 3.1 grams per kilo of lean body mass, um, or about 2.2 to 2.8 grams of protein per kilo of total body mass would be the one I would recommend. The one caveat to that would be if people are particularly overweight, I do recommend that you basically work off of your goal weight when setting protein. So you want to be setting like 2.8 grams per kilo of goal weight. And the reason that I say that is because people who do have quite a lot of weight to lose, their body fat doesn't influence their protein requirement. But if you just work your protein intake off of your total body weight, then, well, you're going to be consuming 400 grams of protein a day for no reason. So to do that again, general public, 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilo. Muscle gain, 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilo. Weight loss, 2.2 to 2.8 grams per kilo of goal body weight. Uh, calories for fat loss, does it matter what macros you have providing you're in a deficit? Well, protein is of course going to be important. Um, do the recommendation I just said. Um, an elevated protein intake during weight loss is going to be important, not just for appetite and all that good stuff that protein provides, but of course for muscle retention. There's no point whatsoever in losing weight, really, if you're just losing muscle mass. And if you've developed a reasonable amount of muscle mass, your body's quite willing to get rid of it if you don't consume protein. So, yeah, protein is going to be really important for weight loss. In terms of carbohydrate and fat, the evidence is fairly emphatically clear that it doesn't matter at that point. Provided you're in a calorie deficit, provided your protein intake is adequate, your intake of carbohydrate and fat doesn't seem to really matter all that much. Uh, carbs before or after training or both for fat loss um, preference always go with preference there will there may be some small advantage to having some carbohydrate pre-training but generally speaking the carbohydrate that you use when you're training is going to be glycogen anyway for the most part and so that is going to be adequately provided for by the carbs you ate yesterday you might benefit a little bit from some carbs pre-workout if you're doing something exhaustive uh, but generally speaking I would just go with preference on that personally. Um, should you go just low carb or add carbs at some point for fat loss, short term and long term effect? I'm not really sure what you're asking there, my dude. Um, as I've just said, it doesn't really matter whether you have high carbs or low carbs during weight loss, provided proteins match, the results will be the same. So 
There you go. Any advice on buying the best scales to monitor body fat? My advice would be to not do that. Um, the new in-body um, measurement thing is quite good, but they're about 10 grand. If you're not paying upwards of five grand for a set of scales, the body fat percentage that it gives you will be wildly inaccurate, and so I don't recommend you do it. Um, you can use scale weight to track your body changes, of course, um, but I would also recommend you use tape measures, especially around the waist. Um, but generally speaking, if your waist circumference is healthy, I would just recommend tracking things in the mirror. Um, just to add to that as well, like, if you're looking to change your body composition for health purposes, or if you're changing your body composition for aesthetic purposes, the specific number of the specific amount of body fat that you have doesn't really change the actions that you're going to do. Like if you think that you want to lose weight for whatever reason, slapping a number on that doesn't change the actions that you're going to take. And so I wouldn't worry too much about what your body fat percentage is. It's, it's basically irrelevant. Um, outside of like some sort of niche medical situations. You don't ever need to know what that number is. And so I don't recommend that you really pay much attention to it, to be honest. Um, dun, dun, dun. If you're new to supplements, pre and post workout, what do you recommend for maintaining muscle mass, whey versus other options? And um, if you are happy to consume whey because you don't, like if, if you're an animal product consumer, whey protein is going to be the one that I would always recommend. Uh, whey protein concentrate, usually something 70 to 80% protein by weight, is excellent. It's basically the best protein source you can consume um, in terms of digestibility and um, usefulness for muscle protein synthesis and all that. So, yeah, I'd recommend you just go for whey protein if you're looking at a protein supplement. Um, protein supplements should be thought of in exactly the same way as like chicken breast or tuna, though. Um, they don't do anything. They're just a source of protein that's quite convenient. I quite like them. I do recommend people use them, but it's important to put them within that context. Um, they're not really going to do much of anything beyond give you some protein. And so when it comes to supplements recommending for pre and post, pre-workout, caffeine is going to be useful. Um, if you're brand new, caffeine's fantastic. If you're looking for like an all-in-one pre-workout that's evidence-based, the awesome supplements one is really good. I had a hand in... Um, formulating that myself and i definitely do vouch for it i'm very happy to put my name next to the awesome supplements pre-workout um but if you're looking for just like protein supplementation just go for whey there's no reason to not go for whey um when would you suggest someone go on a diet break for example if someone's been dieting for over a long period of time if they plan or will having a diet break then go back to dying weight work to drop weight it's a great question i've seen i've got one on facebook from johnny as well i'll come to that next um yeah diet breaks i personally think are very important i first heard from, heard about them from lyle mcdonald and they're starting to be spoken about a lot more in the literature now as well what seems to be quite clear is that diet breaks um of either a week to two weeks but there is some data to suggest that just weekend diet breaks work too are massively useful for adherence um, but they can also potentially assist with lean, body, lean muscle mass retention during the diet, though that seems to be a little bit more inconsistent, and it's probably to do with it's probably to do with the um, the adherence of the individuals. But yes, diet breaks are very important. I usually recommend them. It depends on how lean you are. Um, a more lean person might need a diet break every six weeks. A person that's got an awful lot of weight to lose might be able to go twenty weeks without a diet break. It really is going to depend. And because adherence is always, always, always the number one factor when it comes to dieting, it would always be, in my opinion, something you would work out on a case-by-case -case basis, how often someone needs a diet break to maintain their sanity during the dieting process. But yes, they're very important. Um, what do you think of having the meat and nuts breakfast versus having a protein shake? Physiology behind both of them, which is better if you have time, does it matter? Good question. No, um, no specific food choice really matters without giving me the context of the rest of your diet. Of course, meat and nuts is going to have quite a few nutrients in, but there's absolutely no reason to be avoiding carbohydrates at breakfast if you're eating that for that reason. Um, I can also imagine meat and nuts get really expensive. Like, I like meat, I like nuts, I would perfectly happy to eat a meat and nuts breakfast, but there's no specific benefit to doing that over and above a bowl of oatmeal and some protein powder or some eggs or something like that. Um, 
Hi, Tom. Loving the Q&A. Good. Uh, what sort of rep ranges are more appropriate for endurance training, or would a combination of strength, hypertrophy, and higher ranges be effective? I would definitely recommend doing a combination. Um, if you are looking for endurance performance, you've got to think your weight training isn't just to improve your endurance performance. It's also for general physical preparedness, or GPP. As I mentioned earlier, one of the big things that happens with endurance sports, especially running, is like rampant injury rates. And a lot of this can be potentially down, can potentially be down to various weaknesses, uh, especially around joints. And so if someone's doing endurance training, it could be really handy for you to do some training in the strength or hypertrophy rep ranges once to twice a week. Um, and that'll potentially help you with reducing injury rates. So yeah, I would think of it in those terms. Now, if you're looking at improving your endurance performance then yeah doing the higher rep ranges could potentially be quite useful but for me um if you're someone who's living a normal lifestyle and you, you your time is a little bit limited i would focus your endurance training on getting you better at endurance and i would use your gym work for general physical preparedness um, if you're more interested in that i would look to speak to phil patterson who's someone we work with um if you want me to help you get in touch with them, just drop us a message. I'll put you in touch with Phil. But Phil will be able to fill you in on a bit more details on that. But yeah, I'd recommend gym performance, gym stuff, GPP, sports-specific training is when you're going to get fitter. I wouldn't worry too much about trying to get fitter for endurance sports by doing high rep, leg press, and things like that. When you diet break, am I correct? You don't track your macros and just focus on eating healthy. Um, you can do, though if you are someone that's tracking, it's more beneficial when you're in a diet break to track, not just to stop you overeating, but to stop you undereating. The idea of having a diet break, you need to be bringing those calories up to maintenance, ideally with a relatively high carbohydrate intake. And so if you're on a diet break and you're not reaching maintenance, you may be missing out on some of the physiological benefits uh, to do with resetting leptin and things like that. Though, of course, you could never measure that. You just have to assume that that might be happening. Um, but yeah, when you're on a diet break, you want to be bringing stuff up to maintenance. And so, yeah, I'd recommend you be tracking them too. Um, does eating carbs in the morning cause cravings throughout the day? I heard from a nutritionist it's better not to eat carbs in the morning as you'll crave on sugar throughout the day. Um, what causes one person to crave food is going to be different to what causes everyone else to crave food. But no, there's no reason to assume that if you eat carb carbs in the morning, that it's going to specifically cause you to co crave carbs throughout the day. Um, would you recommend purchasing BCAs and creatine? Creatine, yes. BCAs, no. Uh, BCAs would only be beneficial if you're not eating enough protein throughout the day. And if you're not doing that, I'd recommend you start doing that rather than buy BCAs. There's no reason whatsoever to assume that BCAs would do anything for you if you're already consuming enough protein because BCAs are really important, but you get plenty of them in high quality protein sources and having more doesn't give you any additional benefit. It's one of those things where once you've got enough, you've got enough and getting more, you don't get any extra credit for that. And it's been fairly extensively studied and BCAs basically don't do anything. Uh, does intermittent fasting affect muscle building as it slows down muscle protein synthesis? Um, so the data on this are quite limited. Um, we're limited pretty much to Ramadan fasting, which is, of course, not particularly long term. It's only a month. Uh, in Ramadan fasting studies, muscle protein synthesis and muscle gain in general, strength gain in general, don't seem to be hampered. But of course, that's just relatively short term. What we do know is that after you eat protein, there's what's referred to as a refractory period. So you eat protein, muscle protein synthesis is elevated. It can only be elevated so far, and then it drops off. And if you eat enough protein to maximize that, you've maximized it. If you eat double the protein, you've still maximized it, and it's not elevated for any longer. And so what that means is that it's beneficial for total amount of muscle protein synthesis that's happening during the course of a day to spread your protein out across like three to five meals. And if you're intermittent fasting, it's a bit harder to do that. People who are eating in like an eight hour eating window can definitely still fit in three meals. And so they're probably not likely to, to miss out. But if you're doing intermittent fasting and you're eating all your food in like a two hour window, I would say with reasonable confidence that that is going to be hampering your muscle gain potential. Um, from Facebook, hey Tom, sorry I missed the start. Training for fat loss, training based on resistance work. What sort of supplemental would list cardio? You're definitely going to have to be a bit more specific than that, my dude. Um, resistance training for fat loss, um, 
the same as resistance training for muscle gain, though probably with less volume. And um, so you would do two sets instead of four. Um, training based on resistance work. I'm not sure what you're asking there, I'm afraid, my dude. You'll have to flesh that question out. Um, do you recommend CLA and raspberry extract? I do not. Um, so CLA is another product that doesn't really seem to do much. In fact, what, one of the major studies that I've seen in that is that people supplementing with CLA decrease their insulin sensitivity. Um, I don't know how clinically relevant that was because I haven't looked at CLA research in a very long time, um, but it wasn't good. <laughs> um, I don't recommend supplement with CLA. And raspberry extract, I've not really heard of that, my dude. I don't really know what that is. Um, I mean, you could eat raspberries. They're quite good for you, I suppose. How much body, how much protein can your body consume in one go? Your body will process basically whatever you put in it. It just takes longer. Um, in terms of how much protein is useful for muscle protein synthesis in a sitting, that's going to be between 20 and 40 grams. But you need to bear in mind that if you're trying to build muscle, you're not just looking to increase muscle protein synthesis. You're also looking to reduce muscle protein breakdown, and you're also looking to provide amino acids for total body protein synthesis, which is going to happen in your organs and all of those other important things. And so I don't ever really recommend looking at how much protein can I consume in one go because it's not really a useful question. What I would usually say is Work out how much protein you require across the course of a day, which I've done already, and just break that down by the amount of meals that you're going to consume. But do know that if you're only eating, like let's say you're a big dude and you need like 220 grams of protein and you're going to get that in in three sittings, which is going to be like over 70 grams of protein in a sitting, your body will use all of it. Like your body is not just going to start throwing protein away. You've got to think from an evolutionary perspective, we are an evolved animal and we wouldn't last very long if we had to break our meals up across like five meals because if you find like a wildebeest in the wild or whatever and you kill that and you eat it and you've got no possible way of preserving that food because you're a caveman living on the African savannah then you're going to eat an awful lot of protein in one sitting and we would not have risen to be the most dominant species on the planet if that caused us to crap all the important protein out. Like that's just, that's not a successful species. So no, your body will use whatever you put in it. How many calories do marathon runners usually eat? Uh, of course, that's going to vary completely dependent on the size um, of, the, of the person. Like the bigger you are, the more calories you're going to burn, uh, both at rest and during exercise. A marathon for the average person is probably going to burn somewhere in the region of 3,000 calories, assuming you burn roughly 100 calories per mile, which tends to be about average for the average person. Obviously, it's a big range, but it evens out to roughly about 100 in the middle. So average marathon is going to burn somewhere in the region of 3,000 calories. Most marathon runners don't run marathons in their training, at least not often. They might do one long run a week, which will be less than marathon distance for the most part. So, yeah, marathon runners maybe running three times a week, prob maybe four times a week, probably have a sil similar calorie requirement to someone that's doing resistance training to particularly high standard, maybe a little bit more. Um, but yeah, it's going to depend on how big the person is, what their rest of metabolic rate is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's too much of a how long is a piece of string. Um, does omega-6 oil slow down fat loss? Uh, it will if you eat a lot of it. <laughs> What's the differences with omega-3 versus omega-6? When would you need more omega-3 than 6, omega-6 than 3? Um, you will get plenty of omega-6 from your diet. So <laughs> a fatty acid is a long chain of hydrocarbons. So you've got a whole bunch of carbons linked together in a chain, and off of those carbons will either be one or two hydrogens. If all of the carbons in the chain have two hydrogens attached to them, that's a saturated fat because it's saturated with hydrogen. If two of those carbons are missing a hydrogen in one place, that's a monounsaturated fat because it's unsaturated in one place, mono. If it's got two places or more, then it becomes a polyunsaturated fat. Now, a monounsaturated fat will not always have the missing hydrogens in the same place. And if you are three carbons away from a specific end, then that is an omega-3 fatty acid. If you're six carbons away from the omega from the omega end, then that is omega-6 fatty acid. 
That's the difference between an omega three and an omega six. It's just molecular terms. It's it's that that is actually the difference. Um, when would you need more omega six than three? Um, you wouldn't. You get plenty of omega six in your diet. Um, a yeah, there you go. Uh, what's the best way to work out your own maintenance calories? Um, it's very difficult to do accurately. What I'd usually say is that a any decent calculation, so whether that's the Catch McArdle, uh, which is the one that I recommend, um, if you find the Catch McArdle, or if you go to Awesome Supplements website, so if you go to the Awesome Supplements website, scroll to the bottom, you can find the calorie calculator, or just type in Awesome Supplements calorie calculator on Google, it'll come up. That works off of the Catch McArdle formula, so that'll do it for you. Um, so yeah, get a calculation there. That is always going to be an estimate. There's always going to be a reasonably significant margin of error because all of those calculations, whether it's the Catch McArdle or any of the older ones or any of the newer ones, whatever you do, that has got a whole bunch of assumptions built into it, including your relative muscle mass, including how big your organs are. Um, and then, of course, you're going to use an activity multiplier. So one of those calculations, what they'll do is they'll work out your basal metabolic rate, which is the number of calories that you burn at rest. You can then apply an activity modifier to that, which will be between 0.2 to 0.9, and that will give you an estimate of the amount of calories you burn throughout the day, accounting for all of the activity that you do. Whether that activity is walking to and back from the fridge or running an ultra marathon every day, you'll you'll get an estimate. But there is an estimate because it's impossible for that to pos it is impossible for that to precisely give you the amount of calories that you burn. The only way that you can then work from that is through trial and error. So get your calories tracked, get your goal tracked, get your weight tracked, and just see what happens. It has to be something done through trial and error, or you can go to a lab and they can measure it for you objectively. But that's that's the best way to work out your own maintenance calories. Get an estimate to get you in the ballpark, and then use trial and error from there, making sure that you're really accurately tracking your calories, which is not something that's easy to do. Uh, recovery tips for rest days. Thoughts on Epsom salt baths? There's not a huge amount of data on those, to be honest, but they are nice. Uh, there is a little bit of data on them as far as I'm aware, but it's quite scant, but they've been used for an incredibly long time. And they're quite enjoyable and Epsom salts are cheap, so you might as well. Light stretching, definitely useful for rest days. Active recovery is something that I'm quite fond of, so I do recommend going for walks and things like that on rest days. Uh, food intake for that day, I would keep your food the same day to day if you're just doing standard gym work. The only time I'd recommend that you like dramatically change your food intake, whether you're training or not training, is if you are doing some like longer endurance work because you're going to burn a ton of calories in each session and it gets very difficult to account for that across the week. So in that case, you might want to increase or decrease. Maybe if you're in a big calorie deficit, you might want to have a little bit more food on your training days just to give you a psychological boost and feel that you're fueled. Uh, but realistically, I don't recommend changing your food intake on your rest days and your training days because you've got to bear in mind muscle gain doesn't happen in 24-hour cycles and fat gain doesn't happen in 24-hour cycles. So if you underfeed yourself on rest days when you're trying to build muscle, then all that's going to happen there is that you're going to be potentially hampering your recovery capacity. So don't do that. Getting fit for rugby would like to last a whole game. Should I focus more on hit style training? I wouldn't necessarily focus more on hit style training, but I would definitely say that hit style training is going to be more useful for a rugby player than any other kind of athlete. Well, not any other kind of athlete, but an athlete like a rugby player. So football player, rugby player, hockey player, that kind of thing. Where you're doing lots of intermittent exercise, you need to be fit for in an anaerobic capacity and hit style training is going to be useful for that. I would say as well, though, you do want to be doing some endurance training, especially if you are in a position where you are running quite often during the game. But yeah, that's when, if you're doing something like rugby, that's when hit training is definitely going to be useful. Um, or to Facebook, I'll come to you, Strength Trust Coach Chan, in a minute. Um, I'm weight training four times a week with two cardio days thrown in to reach my fat loss goals, so one full rest day a week. I require 200 grams of protein. I'm experimenting with one meal a day and two meals a day, one before and one after training. Would you say that three meals a day within a certain window would be preferable? During a period of fat loss, it probably matters a lot less how much you distribute your protein around the day because muscle protein synthesis is potentially going to be limited, but you're still going to be limited in muscle protein breakdown by having a relatively high protein intake. Um, and so... 
during muscle gaining phases from a theoretical standpoint, intermittent fasting is probably not optimal. From a fat loss perspective, the difference probably shrinks significantly. Um, you also need to bear in mind that any difference that did appear was probably would probably be quite small. And if by doing two meals a day that are really big, you can adhere to your calorie goal a lot better, then you're going to lose fat that you wouldn't have lost if you weren't doing that. And so your adherence there is probably going to be the more important thing. But ideally, I usually recommend people eat three meals a day. But hell, if two meals a day is something that you can stick to, then eat two meals a day. And as I say, if you are managing to get those 200 grams of protein in per day, then that is going to be reducing muscle loss pretty damn significantly. Whether it'll be perfect or not is very hard to say, but the difference between two meals a day and four meals a day, if you're eating the same amount of protein, is probably going to be negligible. Do high carb cheat days work? They can help with adherence, potentially in some people. In some people, they make adherence a lot worse. They can either be wonderful or particularly negative for your relationship with food too. So it's difficult to say. Um, I would generally only recommend, if you're going to do a high carb day, I would recommend you track it, be aware of the calories. And doing that once a week during calorie deficit can be quite useful for training performance because it's going to top up your glycogen stores. Um, of course, on, on the understanding that it's going to reduce your total weekly calorie uh, deficit. Um, so from that perspective, yeah, they can potentially work. Do they work in terms of increasing your metabolic rate? No. Um, if anything, they reduce fat loss because you eat more calories. But they can be good for adherence. It's very difficult to fit in tasty foods if you've got a very low calorie intake. So especially if you're like a small female athlete on like 1,100 calories a day, you ain't going to fit a magnum into that. But if you have one day a week at maintenance with a higher carb intake, you get a little bit more fun food that's going to be useful for your adherence. You're going to feel a bit more full and it might help you train them too. So from that instance, they can certainly potentially help. I also recommend, as I mentioned earlier, full diet breaks at least every like 12 weeks where you would go for one to two weeks of eating at maintenance during a diet phase that's lasting quite long. That's going to be useful for adherence. It might be good for body composition, though the data on that are a bit lacking. There are some. I think there was a study published about that this week, actually, which I haven't read yet. Um, but the Matador study, all capital letters, Matador, that was quite illuminating. Um, sauna suits. Study shown it's not recommended to use it during cardio as it put pressures on the heart. Use it for cardio or not. No, I don't recommend you use sauna suits for cardio. The only thing that's going to do is make you sweat more, which is useless for anyone other than potentially boxers or people like that that are trying to dehydrate to meet weight for a fight. Um, they don't help you burn more calories. They don't help you burn more fat. I don't recommend you use sauna suits. The risks massively overstrip any potential benefit. What's omega-9? Omega-9 is the same as omega-6 or omega-3, but the, um, the carbons in the carbon chain that are missing the hydrogens are just at the ninth position. Um, carbs. Carbs every day or weekly carb refeed day, saving all the carbs for one day. What works better physiologically? Um, probably carbs every day, I would say. If you have an extremely high carb intake on one day, you can get super compensation. During that time, you'll store a bit more glycogen than you already would. Um, but it's a bit of a burden. It's potentially going to cause you some GI distress. It's quite antisocial. I don't recommend it. Outside of unusual circumstances my recommendation is basically always to keep your food intake roughly the same every day um, unless it is your preference to not do that i quite often find that people prefer having fewer calories during the week more calories on the weekend brilliant do that that's something that you can stick to but in terms of having low carbs during the week and then one carb up i mean there's certain situations in which you could do that like a cyclical ketogenic diet if you want to read a bit more about that, I'll recommend checking Lyle McDonald's Ultimate Diet 2.0. Um, that's a good resource for that. But generally speaking, from a physiological perspective, it's probably going to make very little difference to most people. The only time that I would recommend carb cycling to such an extreme, so big calorie deficit during the week, very low carbs, calorie surplus during the weekend, very high carbs, um, would be for people who are already very, very lean, looking to lose like the last little bits of fat that might help get rid of what is referred to as stubborn fat, but it's hypothetical.
Uh, hi, is it worth eating more carbs for Olympic lifting, both pre-training and recovery? Yeah, Olympic training, Olympic lifting is just as demanding as any other form of resistance exercise. Arguably more, because most Olympic lifters who are very good at it also do bodybuilder work or something similar. And so, yeah, I'd, I'd certainly recommend a higher carb diet for someone that's doing Olympic lifting. I'd also recommend creatine supplementation. Um, Olympic lifting uses primarily the phosphocreatine system because it's extremely explosive activity that lasts quite a few, not very many seconds. And so you're going to be able to fuel that, fuel that well with phosphocreatine. So you might want to use creatine supplementation to just top up those phosphocreatine stores. It's going to potentially be beneficial. But yes, I would also recommend a higher carb diet. Um, fast versus slow carbs pre-weight training and generally brown versus white rice. So brown versus white rice difference is basically nothing. I wouldn't worry about it at all because you've got to, rec you've got to, you've got to bear in mind. When you're looking at foods, um, the, you can look at like the GI, the glycemic index of that food or the glycemic load of that food or whatever you want to do. Um, but the glycemic index is the primary reason why most people would suggest that you go for brown rice over white rice. But you've got to bear in mind, you don't eat white rice on its own. You eat white rice alongside usually a fat source, almost always a protein source if you're asking me this question, and probably some vegetables which are going to contain fiber. And if you look at the GI of that meal, whether it's got white rice or brown rice in it, the difference is going to be absolutely negligible. And so I would go with the one that you prefer. It doesn't really matter. In terms of fast versus slow carbs pre-weight training, as I mentioned earlier in this, um, the carbs that you use for weight training will mostly be the carbs that you ate yesterday because they're stored in glycogen stores. I'd use that as a turn of phrase. You could have eaten them whenever. It's, it's glycogen stores rather than the food that you eat immediately pre-training. And so it matters a bit less. I would usually say, though, that you're probably going to go for stereotypically fast carbs pre-training. Uh, so low GI, low fiber carbs for the simple fact that if you do that, you can get quite a few carbohydrate. You can get quite a lot of carbohydrate on board without the bloat that you're going to experience by eating like high volume foods the last thing you want to do is be shitting yourself in the squat rack and so going for a higher gi form lower fiber form of carbohydrate pre-training may be useful um but yeah it's not something to worry about the only thing the only time i would really look at fast versus slow carbs is if you're going to be training more than once in a day. So maybe you do AM training and then PM training, or maybe you're in a competition, like a CrossFit competition, where you do a bunch of wads throughout the day with the space now. Um, you want to be having fast-acting carbs in those situations because you want to make sure that those carbs are getting into your system and topping up the glycogen after training session one in order to be able to perform in training session two. Outside of that situation, it matters a lot less, and that's compounded even further when you consider the fact that you don't just eat these foods, you eat them within meals, and the overall composition of a meal is going to completely change the GI of the food itself. So there you go. As a chef, I work crap hours. Uh, I've been there. That was one of my first jobs. I wasn't a chef. I was a cook. Um, but, yeah, the hours are horrendous. Um, and by this, my eating times are bad. Recently, I've got muscle food meals. I'm worried I may not get enough nutrients, or is this okay? Um, as always, that sounds like you're trying to do the best with the situation you've got, and the best sit the best you can do in the situation that you've got is the best you can do. Like You can't really ask for much more for you, from yourself than that. But what I would say is if you are relying on something like um, – pre-made meals and stuff like this that's usually fine but they tend to be quite skimpy on the vegetable portion and so what i'd recommend as a chef you'll know how to do this but i would try to prep some like big batch meals uh, utilize a slow cooker utilize big pots and try to get your own stuff prepped that will be the ideal situation but if you can't do the ideal situation then Working with the un with the less than ideal situation, something you can do. You could also look to potentially get a multivitamin in there. Again, the awesome supplements one's good. It's the one I use, um, just to cover your bases, give you a little bit of a safety net. But generally speaking, it's the same as anyone. There are a lot of jobs that that involve really crappy hours. Admittedly, a lot of them are not as crappy as chef hours, but you do get a lot of people that work crappy hours, and it just comes it comes down to prep as much as you can and what you can't prep buy in by using ready meals which are a bit more expensive but there you go 
Um, Instagram is about to kick me off live because it only lets you go for an hour. Um, so what I'll do is I will end that there. I realize I've got a couple of questions on Facebook, so I'll answer them and then I'll go. But Instagram, thank you very much for tuning in. I hope this has been useful. I've been on for an hour, which is amazing. You've asked some really cool questions and I'll catch you in a bit. So Facebook. <laughs> um, so adding on to that fast versus slow question, sports drinks like power, power it, et cetera, are useless pre-rugby. Pre-rugby potentially, what you're looking at there, there was intra-workout carbohydrates and intra-workout carbohydrates for exercise that is exhausting that lasts longer than an hour um, may improve your performance. So yeah, getting some fast acting carbohydrates in it, during exercise that lasts over an hour, I apologize, I probably should have given that caveat to the pre-carb question too. Um, that's going to be beneficial. So if you're doing something that's lasting over an hour, yes, some carbohydrate, 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour for exercise lasting longer than an hour. It is ideally in a solution that's about 8% glucose, which will be what power it is, um, would be what you would be looking at that can potentially improve your performance for sure. Um, your thoughts on fasted weight training with your Himbin supplementation. So fasted training with your Himbin can potentially help to reduce stubborn fat. For most people, that's not going to be needed because most people don't have stubborn fat. They just have fat that they need to lose and they can do that through a calorie deficit and that's fine. Um, but your Himbin supplementation can be really, can be potentially beneficial if you're going to do fasted training. If you don't do fasted training, your Himbin doesn't do anything. Um, so yeah. It's something that might help. All I would say is that, as I always say to people who train fasted, track your performance because fasted training can definitely work, but it sometimes doesn't, um, especially if when people are in a calorie deficit. If you go to the gym feeling depleted, you might not be feeling up for it. And so, yeah, if you're feeling that your gym performance is being hampered potentially by faster training, then I would say the benefit that you get from faster training with your Himbin is massively outstripped by the drawback of not training well. But if you feel that you're training well in a fasted state and you want to use your Himbin, it might help with fat, with fat utilization. But again, this doesn't invalidate the whole calorie deficit thing. All this means is that as you get leaner, it gets progressively more difficult to retain muscle mass and it gets progressively more difficult to burn body fat because what happens is your body becomes more likely to burn muscle mass than body fat. So this isn't invalidating a calorie deficit, but your Himbin might potentially in that situation, if you're already very lean, it might shift the goalposts a little bit, enabling your body to utilize body fat more effectively rather than tapping into muscle stores. Um, so your Himbin can potentially be useful in that situation. But if you're not in a situation whereby you're, going through like stubborn fat. So if you're not like abs out lean already, um, the difference that that'll make is something that I'm not sure how I would comment on. I don't think it would make much of a difference. It's a cool question though, it's a good one. Not a lot of people, not a lot of people know about that. Awesome, cool. Well, thank you very much guys. I'm gonna end that one there because this is the longest Q&A in the history of time to the point that Instagram literally kicked me out. Um, I hope this has been useful. Uh, you've asked some really cool questions, so thank you very much for that. Um, I will probably be back next Wednesday, so if you've got something you want to ask, keep it in your head, <laughs> chuck it in then. I uh, hope you all have a wonderful evening, and I'll catch you in a bit. Cheers, everyone.